Welcome back. I'm That Chemist, and today I'm going to tell you about a really, really stupid thing that I did at one point in time. This story involves carbon disulfide as well as molten sodium. So, as you may be aware, I've done quite a bit of sulfur chemistry in the past. And so one day I decided that I was going to make sodium tetrathiooxalate. Now the reason why I was doing this isn't particularly important. I just thought maybe I could make some interesting fluorine containing derivatives if I made uh, ester derivatives of the tetrathiooxalate. And so there was this original German procedure that I found published in 1927 where they take a mercury amalgam and carbon disulfide and simply at reflux of the carbon disulfide, they're able to make sodium tetrathiooxalate. And so naturally, if you look at this procedure, there's one element that we don't really like to work with, and that's mercury. Now, the reason we don't like to work with mercury is that mercury salts tend to be quite toxic. And even though this is just an amalgam, we tend to have a little bit of a skittishness towards any use of mercury in any context. And that's because maybe just in workup, maybe when we're doing stuff, we're not anticipating what could possibly happen, and maybe there's slight, some slight risk of a mercury contamination. So naturally, I decided that I'd come up with a revised approach. And so the whole purpose of using a sodium amalgam in this first step is to increase the surface area of the sodium. If it's more fluidic, then it's able to react better. Whereas the sodium in the solid state might just form like a crust around the sodium and then it prevents it from reacting any further. So there's like a good rationale for why you'd want to use an amalgam. And so my approach was instead to do a melt of the sodium in diglime. So to do this, I had chosen diglime as a solvent because it has a relatively high boiling point. Now I'd still use carbon disulfide, but I do this in a sealed vial and you'll see why in a minute. So on paper, this looks fine. No issues here. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. And so uh, if you aren't aware of this, sodium amalgam is usually a liquid. Obviously, it depends on how much mercury to sodium you have. But uh, if you have enough mercury, it'll be a liquid. I didn't want to work with mercury because mercury bad. And the sodium still needs to be a liquid or at least have a decently high surface area. Part of it should be liquid or easily remove the product as it forms. So a polar solvent would also help with that because it can more easily dissolve the salt product and then maybe that would help it uncake off the sodium as the product forms. And so what you need to do is heat the sodium hot enough to melt. So sodium has a relatively low melting point of 98 degrees Celsius. This would essentially mean that if you had boiling water right at its boiling point, if you had sodium in a vessel within that, it should melt the sodium or it'd be pretty close. And so I figured that a good solvent for this would be an ether containing solvent that would help dissolve the sodium, but still had a decently high boiling point. I'd considered doing 1,4-dioxane, which has a boiling point of about 108, but I've worked with sodium before and it's a little bit stubborn to melt around its melting point, probably because there's that heat of fusion required to actually melt the sodium. So if I have a bit of extra head headroom to melt things, that would make it a little bit easier. And because I'm already concerned about the carbon disulfide in this reaction, I figure if I pick a less volatile solvent, that would probably help things as well. And so the, the biggest concern here is that carbon disulfide boils at 46 degrees Celsius. And you might be thinking, rut row, that's not good. And so uh, I figured if I just heat this all in a sealed vial, the carbon disulfide won't be able to, to escape. And so it shouldn't matter that we're that high over its boiling point. Now, I'm only doing a little bit of an excess of carbon disulfide because I want to consume all the sodium. And so I didn't think that the pressure would be that big of an issue. And so basically, I've kind of got this illustration here to talk you through what happened. So initially, we got these big chunks of sodium that I've drawn here, and we have a stir bar stirring. This is all on a stir plate in a heat block so that it heats effectively. This is in one of those chem glass heat blocks that I talked about in my chemistry lab life hacks video, which I will include a card to here. And you can see that initially, the mixture of carbon disulfide and diglime is clear because they're both clear colorless liquids. Now, once I'd started heating it for a bit, quickly what happened is the sodium melted and it formed like thousands of tiny little beautiful droplets. Like this is one of the coolest things ever. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in the research lab. And as one might expect, the tetrathiooxalate, once it's no longer carbon disulfide, forms this beautiful red solution. So I started seeing the formation of a red solution as well as the internal reflux of my solvents within this closed vial. Now, I could see a lot of internal reflux happening and... I could see that the chemistry is happening, so I was pretty pleased with myself. But, you know, I might be a little bit stupid, but I'm not, like, that stupid. So I did what anyone uh, in their right mind might do, and I put a little evaporating dish over top just in case crap hit the fan, the vial exploded. I thought, you know, just in case I'd put this piece of glass on top, that would help contain stuff, especially if it caught fire or something. 
it you know just made sense but like this right here is what you need to pay attention to if you're if you're taking a precaution like this it probably means you already know that you're doing something stupid okay and in my case that happened to be the case and so uh, I walked across the lab and uh, I heard a loud bang crash and so I quickly ran back over the glass had shattered everywhere the top part of the lid had blown off but none of the vial had exploded However, the contents of the, the vial were now on fire, and there was fire in and around the vial. And so uh, I was worried about putting this out with water, because this is an organic fire. You can't just put those out with water in most cases. And it was a small enough fire that I didn't need to go and get a fire extinguisher. So I, uh, I filled up a little evaporating dish that I had full of sand, and I just yeeted it into the vial. And fortunately, the sand was able to put it out. And so it was just like a pretty terrifying experience, but you know, sometimes if something feels stupid and it sounds stupid and you don't check the pressure tolerances of a vial or a cap, you know, maybe you shouldn't do uh, reactions way above the boiling point of one of your components of your mixture in a sealed environment. So uh, I also got Dolly Mini, which is this AI to kind of simulate what happened here. And so if you've never used Dolly Mini, it's a, it's a free... Um, Thing you can go to online i'll include a link to it in the description where you can just kind of type out a thing and it will create an ai simulated picture of what what happened and so unfortunately i don't have real pictures of this uh experiment because i didn't take pictures i was trying to uh deal with the fire not not go oh neat fire and so this is gonna have to this is gonna have to be sufficient for you so yeah uh, hopefully this has been an entertaining video. If you like this style of video, make sure you comment down below and tell me so I do more in the future. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribed, and I hope you have a great day.